Luke chapter number 8, verses 1 through 4. Again, our theme for the year, um, let us build. And again, um, kind of another, not a Bible quote, but another slogan that we could definitely have is every Christian a builder, not just every Christian existing and claiming to be a Christian, not just every Christian attending church, although it's good, but every Christian building on, on the work of God. We'll be talking about that in the next couple of weeks, but tonight especially, I want to um, encourage us with this. Last week, we talked about building our walk with Christ. I really hope that that was helpful to you, and I hope that you worked on that this week. I, I'm not saying, and I, wasn't, I don't think, my, my intentions were not to say that no one here had a walk with God. I'm certain that many of you did and do have a walk with the Lord. But it's something that we can all work on, and sadly, what happens to me and a lot, all of us a lot of times, some of us a lot of times, is we, our walk with God becomes our walk with God time, and we just have our structure, we read our Bible, we pray, we move on, and it's not really a time of communication and fellowship with God, and even though we spend time with the Lord in the morning, doesn't necessarily mean that we spend time with God following the Lord all day. And that ought to be your life. The Christian life is a walk with Christ, following Christ. And it's not just I made a decision to try to do what's right, but every day we walk with the Lord. And hope, hopefully you've been doing that and are still working on that. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're new at this, if you're a new Christian or you're just learning to spend time with God and what it means to walk with God, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. But you'll be working on it all your life. <laughs> things we got to check on, things we need to examine, things we need to fix. Um, but our walk with the Lord is a constant pursuit of God and walking with Him. So again, I hope that's the desire of your heart to walk with the Lord. Tonight, I want to be very practical, and we'll look at some this couple of verses, um, verses 1 through 4, and look at kind of a pattern that Jesus gives. And um, by the way, I stole this. <laughs> um, I remember in Bible college, someone teaching these, this, basically this idea. I've changed it around a bit and, and obviously preaching my own thoughts, but the basic idea stole from somebody else. There's nothing new under the sun. So, you know, if any, if any other preach, if any preacher ever says that they made up something, you run far, far away. Because if they made it up, then it didn't come from here. So, um, <laughs> but, so we're always just preaching and teaching what the Word of God says anyways. But Luke, someone found it before I did. But Luke 8, let me just read. Luke 8, verse 1 through 4. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And certain women which had, healed of evil, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. And Susanna and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake a parable. Lord, I thank you for a pattern and a picture that you give us here. And we could find the same thing in Timothy and perhaps other places. But God, I pray that you speak to us tonight about what we are in your work and what we need to do, where we can grow and who we need to reach. God, I pray that in this group here tonight, you would work in people's hearts so that some people here would become laborers for you and maybe take some steps forward in how to work in a greater capacity and how, and how to help more people. Lord, none of us are more important than the other. We're all valuable. But Lord, you have a purpose for us to fulfill and may we do it and may we see where we can do more. Speak to us tonight through your word. I ask for your help. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A church, it's, it's a living, breathing thing where the Lord Jesus Christ is constantly at work in the lives of, the lives of those that make it up. God is always developing our Christian life to make it de deeper and to make it stronger. Uh, God is teaching us new things so we can know Him better and live a, live a better life for Him, knowing what He expects of us and knowing more about His character. God is always dealing with people also that not, are, not just that are with Him, but God is always dealing with people that are straying from Him. He's always pursuing. We find the picture of Jesus leaving, or the, of the shepherd leaving the 99 and going after the one that was lost. I'm glad Jesus does that. I'm glad that Jesus pursues those that are lost and, and holds those that are lost in such high value. But God is always trying to reach the lost through Christians 
that are willing to share the gospel with those around them. Hudson Taylor gave this quote. It's a short and easy one. Hudson Taylor once said, God is always advancing. I think that's a good one. God is always advancing. And we should always be advancing forward for the Lord and toward the Lord. Uh, The Christian life, it's a building and growing process that continues and will continue until we meet Jesus. Then we'll be perfect. But we're not perfect yet, are we? No, we're not, we're not there yet. So if we're the Christians that we should be, it's a constant growth and mat- maturation, maturity issue, <laughs> a constant work of God helping us to grow. In Luke chapter number 8, we find four different kinds of people that are in every church. And the, there's four types of people in every church. And God wants us to... We, well. I'm trying to think of how to say it. I could just read my notes. In each of these situations, we might find ourselves, and we might find where God wants us to be next. Uh, maybe is a way to say that. But let's read this again, and I'll point it out, those four different kinds of people when we get there. But in Luke 8, verse 1, And it came to pass afterward that He... Who's He? It's Jesus. So first we find Jesus. He's the leader. Okay? That He went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with them. Who are the twelve? Those are the disciples, those are the apostles, those are the workers. Now, this might, be a, might not be a perfect science, but it'll make the point. Verse 2, at least my application of the passage isn't a perfect science. And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others which ministered unto him of their substance. We find those women, the certain women, and we find many others. Those are the followers. And then verse 4, And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake a parable. That last section in verse number 4, the much people, those are the people that need to be reached. In all of our lives and in every church, there's leaders, there's workers, there's followers, and people that need to be reached. Let's, let's say that together. Number one, there's leaders. Secondly, there's workers. Thirdly, there's followers. And fourthly, there's people that need to be reached. That's a bit of a longer one, right? Not, not quite as the same ring to it. In your life, there's always people that need to be reached. Again, everyone in this room, if I wanted to, I might could do my best to say, they're probably that person, they're probably that person, they're probably that person. Um, maybe some of them blend, some of them are growing into a new position, that kind of thing. And again, this isn't about importance, it's not about value. But as we grow, we, uh, we become something different. But also, not everyone's meant to be a leader, like Jesus was, or like the apostles would be. So not everyone's going to stand, and it's not even necessarily about standing up in front of people. There's leaders in this church that, don't have a, that don't, aren't as publicly seen. You don't have to have that kind of ministry necessarily to lead people, right? Every husband should be some kind of leader, leading their family, things like that. But, and there's, women can be leaders in many ways as well. But there's leaders, there's workers, there's followers, and there's people that need to be reached. And every church needs godly leaders. People to keep the church strong and stable and moving in the right direction. People to lead the way. Every church needs workers, People willing to listen, to learn, and labor for the Lord. Sometimes seen, sometimes not. Every church needs to have followers. Sometimes new Christians that are beginning to have victories and learning what's true. And maybe not necessarily spiritually mature, but learning. And every church, this may sound backwards, you've heard me talk about this before, but every healthy church will have people coming into it that, are, that need to be reached. If you invite lost people to come, then lost people will come. If you don't ever invite people that need to be reached, we won't reach them. And by the way, the perfect plan would be that we go out and out of these, outside of these walls, we'd reach people for Jesus Christ, we'd win them the Lord, we'd disciple them and bring them in, they would be followers learning to grow. But sometimes it's good just to get people in. We know how it works. How many of you were saved in a church service of some kind? Right. So it's, sometimes it helps to get people in the door. I was saved at a youth camp, right? Um, that was kind of a church service type thing. We get the point. But, but it is our job as a church to reach people. It's our job to grow. It's our job to help others grow. And as a church, we need to be building laborers for Christ. 
And this, these four groups of people, helping people come along is building laborers. Again, they may not become a leader, but we need to be reaching people and then them developing into followers and developing into workers and maybe even developing into some kind of leader in many ways. But I want to go backwards through this text and, make, and just explain what these people are and what our responsibility is with them. Does that make sense? So the outline, that's the outline, but we'll go backwards through it and, and kind of show our need as a church to deal with them. And hopefully this will be helpful to you. Number one, there's people we need to reach. People need to reach. I heard the, this statement. I thought it was, it was great. There's a golden rule for reaching and helping people. There's a golden rule for reaching and helping people. Love and accept people where they are. Love and accept people where they are. Does that mean we love and accept everything they do? No. I'm going to get some of you in trouble. How many of you, you have a husband or a wife that does not always do everything perfect? I can't raise my hand. Right, we all do. Do you love him, your husband? Do you love your wife? Are your children perfect? No. Do you love them? Right. We get the point. But with my children, you know, they're 11 and 8. They're not where they should be in life because they're 11 and 8. But where they are, I accept them. But the goal is to help them grow and become something different. They're not very mature adults, are they? Why? Because they're not. <laughs> they're not adults, and I shouldn't expect that from them. You shouldn't expect your 2-year-old to be able to do certain things that a 5-year-old can do. You love and accept them where they are, but the goal is to help them move forward. With sin, we don't love and accept the sin, but we want to help them. We want to love people where they are. We need to have compassion on people. We need to be patient with people. We need to love people even though they have flaws. And again, they, were not, they, they will not always be where they are now. Hopefully not. If, if someone never grows, there's a, there's a problem. But people eventually will learn to accept new responsibility, and we need to love people where they are and help them grow where, from where they are to somewhere new. Or who, who are these people that we need to reach? In, the verse, in verse number four, it says, And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he sp- uh, I mis- I'd read it with the wrong uh, emphasis, on the, emphasis on the wrong syllable. Um, and when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake a parable. That's a little bit better. Here it says there were much people. So the majority of the crowd here were people that needed to be reached. That's how it is in our world. The vast majority of the people you see every day are people that need to be reached. Right? Most people in Hinesville, Georgia are not saved people. And even if they're saved, many people, there's people that are saved that need to be reached. There's people that attend our church every once in a while that still need to be reached. They need to be reached out to and helped and encouraged to follow the Lord a little bit better, right? So we can even add them to it. That's kind of a distant application. But we're mainly aiming at the lost. But there, here, there, he says there's, a multi, there's much people, there's a multitude. If you look at the Matthew passage and the Mark passage, it's parallel passages that tell, tell the same story. It says that in this crowd, there's a multitude that's thousands of people. There's thousands of people that are there that were gathered together so they can hear from Jesus. Where did they come from? Verse 4 says, out of every city. So there's people all around us that need Jesus. We get that. In our neighborhoods, in your school, if you go to school, um, at your work, at Walmart, at the gas station, your next door, whatever, in your family, there's people all around us that need to be reached. You know, You want to know how those people got there? Somebody, in many, in, at least in some ways, they reached them. In that city, someone let them know, hey, there's a guy that's preaching the Bible, the new truth, Jesus can do that because he's Jesus. There's a guy that's capable of healing. There's a guy that can answer prayer. And by the way, that guy is God. Would you like to meet him? Somebody had to spread the word. Somebody had to tell those multitudes of people that Jesus the Christ was available. Or they wouldn't have ever known. They would have known. To, they would not have been. Um, they wouldn't have known to come hear Jesus teach unless somebody told. Somebody had to do the job. But everyone we see that is not saved, and we, again we can go a little bit further. Everyone that's not saved, that's uh, baptized or faithfully attending a good, solid church, needs to be reached. <laughs> and by the way, and I've said this, it sounds unkind, but it's true. If you don't know they're saved, assume they're not, because they're probably not. Most people aren't saved. It's sad but true. They need to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Few there be that find it. 
Jesus said this in John 4, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. In other words, now's the time. There's a harvest that needs to be reached. It's big, it's white, it's ready. Let's go get it. So what are we doing? We talked about that this morning, missing the opportunity. People need to be reached from everywhere. How, so where do they come from? Out of every city, I already said this. How did they hear about what was going on? Someone told them. Someone told them about Jesus. Someone shared from their life how it was changed. Um, somebody uh, saw, the, saw miracles happen. They told the others about the miracles and how they were helped. But someone has to tell them. People will not be reached unless someone that has been reached tells them. Somebody, I, I don't know if this is exactly true. Let's assume that it's close though. But... I've read the statistic many times, but around 80% of people would likely come to a church service if they were personally invited. Now, we hand out tracts, and we ought to do everything we can to reach people with the gospel. That doesn't really count as, you know, as a personal invite. 80% of the tracts that we give out don't result in people coming to church. But if you personally invited someone, statistics say, if you personally invite someone that you know, around 80% of those people would, would eventually come. That tells me something about me that I don't invite that many people personally. How about you? Well, they already go to a church once a year. <laughs> I've invited them once before, 12 years ago. We need to do better. We need to do better. But there's always people that need to be reached. Someone said there's two kinds of people that are hard to be reached. You may want to write them down. This is highly deep and theological. There's two kinds of people that are hard to reach. Number one, people that you don't like. Those people are hard to reach. Is there anyone around you that you don't like? Don't, not right now. Um, but are there people that you don't like? Did you know the Bible deals with, how, with what to do with people that you don't like? John 4 deals with that. The woman at the well, she wasn't liked because she was of the wrong nationality. There's another word that we could use. She was of, for the Jews, she was of the wrong race. We know there's only one race, the human race, that's biblical. We all come from the same place. But that's, the Jews had a prejudice problem. They didn't want to go to Samaria. But Jesus did. Jesus went to someone that was of the wrong nationality, and by the way, lived the wrong life. She'd been married multiple times, was living with a guy, she was living in sin. So what do you do with people that you think are immoral and dirty and you don't want to be around them? What do you do with people that come from the wrong background, that don't speak the same language? What do you do with people that are of the wrong nationality, wrong race, wrong culture, that just don't act right, don't smell right? What do you do with them? I don't like them. It doesn't matter what you like. Jesus loves them. And that's the point. It does not matter who you like. Jesus loves them. So we reach them. And you pray that God would change your heart about the matter. <laughs> but when we realize that God loves them, how you feel about them doesn't really matter. Because our opinions, our feelings, even if they're wrong or right, doesn't really matter. We understand that God loves them, so we follow what the Lord says. There's another kind of people that are hard to reach. Not only people that you don't like, but people that don't like you. Surprising as it may be, I know of people in this world that don't like me. You may be one of them. But there are people in this world that don't like them. Some people just generically don't like Christians because they've had negative experiences. You ever met someone, invited someone to church, but because something bad happened to them before, or they actually knew a bad Christian, which would not be really a Christian, but someone, you know, they weren't a true follower of Christ. Um, but if, you know what I'm saying, because of this happening to me, I won't come to church. That's terrible. That has, again, that has everything to do with the message this morning, but not hurting the name of Christ but we need to do the best we can to remove as many unnecessary obstacles as you can. As many unnecessary obstacles as you can. By the way, we're going to preach the Word of God. People may not like it, but it's biblical, so we'll do it. And it's the right thing to do, and the Bible's what helps people. The gospel is offensive, but we're not going to quit preaching the gospel. There are certain things that we ought to do, and it's necess it, is, it may be a necessary obstacle. Jesus himself, the Bible says, was a stumbling block. He was offensive to people, but he was slightly necessary. 
right? So there's certain things that are perhaps we could say necessary obstacles, but there's certain things that are unnecessary. There's, um, I found all these things or heard all these things that I'm stealing from other people, but there's four main reasons why people don't like church or don't like Christians and why, at least why they don't come to church. The number one reason, because people there aren't friendly. You just know you can cure that problem. I've been to churches where people were not friendly. Churches that preach the truth, believe the truth, that love the Lord, but were not friendly. And I never wanted to go to that church again. That may sound unspiritual. I was saved and I was a preacher. I never wanted to go to that church again because people weren't friendly. So you know how you fix that? You be friendly. You be kind to people. You be welcoming to people. Well, I don't know them, but I'm shy. Who cares? Be friendly anyways. It's boring. That's reason number two. It's boring. So be excited. Did you know you and I, we can make the church more exciting without being liberal, without compromising? We absolutely can. The songs that we sang this morning and tonight, there can be some excitement and some zeal and some thrill about what we're singing about. There's not a verse in the Bible that sings that says, sing it monotone with a frowny face looking at the floor. There's no verse in the Bible that says that's how you're supposed to sing hymns. That's why I made fun of BVN on Wednesday, because that's what it sounds like. But anyways, uh, I did it again. But uh, we can sing with excitement and zeal. If you're saved, it ought to be there. If you can sing songs full of Bible truth about salvation without it giving you a little bit of gratitude, a little bit of a smile, there's something wrong with your spirit. There ought to be some excitement, some zeal, and you may just not be paying attention, which we all do that from time to time. But we need to do better. We can, we can, our church can be exciting and happy, and, we need to, and you and I need to be involved with what we're doing and energetic. You ought to smile. You ought to be, you ought, you ought to, when people come in, hey, welcome to church. You don't have to be a nut, but you know, invite people and welcome. Don't scare people. But it'd be encouraging. Don't let people walk in that door and sit down and no one speaks to them before church starts. If it's 10 after, there's nothing you can do about it. But speak to people. By the way, if someone walks in late, you walk over to them and give them a hymn book and say, hey, I'm so glad you're here. Um, Brent can't be here tonight. But Brent, uh, there's a new lady that came this morning. She had her kids with, him, with her, and she had no idea about kids' class. And every week I see people come in and things like that, and I hope... I hope someone said something about a kid's class or nursery or whatever, and he just went and did it. He didn't, no one had told him to do that, but he figured out to be friendly, and he's as shy as can be, and he brought the kids to kid's class. I'm thankful for that. We need to do that kind of stuff. Let, make church simple for people. That's kind of the third one. People don't want to come to church because it's, people aren't friendly because it's boring, and I don't understand what to do. Make things simple, plain. Help people understand what we're, going, what we're doing and what the structure is. I, I don't always do it, and sometimes it sounds dumb, and I tend to make things complicated sometimes. But that's why we put the page number on the screen. We're not going any direction. We just want people to know what song we're singing. So if they come in late and miss the number, so when Brother Andy's hearing aid's not working, he knows what song we're singing. <laughs> so we want to make things simple. Sometimes I'll say, in a minute we're going to sing... We try to make things simple so people know when to sit down and when to stand up. You ever been in a church like that? You don't know what's coming next? And then that's, that's why you never sit up front and you go to a new church. You're still standing and everyone's sitting, you know? And you're, you're the one that you'll never come back to that church. But, but make things help people. People aren't friendly. It's boring. I don't understand. And there's nothing for my kids. So we have stuff for the kids. For, not just for that reason, but we want to help children know the Lord. But there's always people that need to be reached. And it's not just soul winning, although that's a big part of it. We ought to be soul winners. We ought to give the gospel to people. We ought to hand out tracts. We ought to invite people. We ought to confront people about their soul. We ought to do all those things. But when people are coming here, we ought to love them and reach out to them and try to help them. There's people that need to be reached. Number two, and I spent a long time on that one, there's followers. Followers. Verses two and three. And certain women which had been healed of, of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others which ministered unto him of their substance. His followers. These ladies, they pop up from time to time in the gospel records and throughout the Bible. They were with the followers of the Lord. The disciples, the apostles, they were a little bit different than these ladies for, for several reasons, but... They love the Lord. I think even it says they ministered. So in some ways, these followers were workers too, but it messes up my outline. But these people had met the Lord. The point is these people had met the Lord. God had begun changing their life. 
something had happened to them. It, it says that certain women which had been healed of evil spirits, these ladies were saved, and they had seen God work in their life. They had seen at least a little bit of victory. It's a new, immature, growing Christian. Let me show you a couple of verses. Go with me. Turn to Psalm 107. Psalm 107. We know that's not everyone that has experienced salvation in their, in their life and that their life has been changed as a mature Christian. But those that are saved should be learning to follow the Lord. Those ladies that witnessed miracles, the demons being cast out, things like that, God had changed who they are. So these are new Christians, saved people. Psalm 107, verse 17. I thought this was a great illustration of what God can do. One of those passages I never noticed this thought before. Psalm 107, verse 17. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. In other words, their life is hard. What kind of people? Their life is afflicted? Fools. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. What kind of people? Fools. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and He saveth them out of their distresses. What kind of people? Fools. He sent His word and healed them, and delivered them from their destructions. What kind of people? Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness. And for his wonderful works to the children of men. You never know what God can do with anybody. God can save, God can change anybody and turn anyone into a follower of the Lord. God's just looking for praise, God's looking to get glory. God says, if they'll just turn to me, if they'll just come to me for help, I'll deliver them. There's followers. These women that, and even it just says, the, um, what's the word that he uses? Um, and many others. So there's several ladies and these many others that had experienced healings of their, healed of their evil spirits and infirmities. So maybe they had some physical problems, but they, they had been cured, they had been healed. But Jesus changed their life and now they're with Him and now they're following the Lord. They're excited about the Lord. There's some love for the Lord out of just simple gratitude for what He's done. So they're just getting started. They're just now interested in wanting to begin helping um, with serving the Lord and wanting to know the Lord. When a, new, when a person gets saved, a lot of times that's their heart. All they know is they got saved, they're going to heaven, and they just want to read their Bible. They just want to pray. They don't know everything about it. It. They may come up with crazy ideas, but they just love the Lord and they want to get close to Him. They're wanting to follow Jesus. They may not know how. They may say crazy things, uh, but they're just trying to follow Jesus. Praise God for it. Our church should always have a constant flow of new, baby, immature Christians that we will love and accept where they are. If we don't have a constant flow of new, baby Christians, it's because we're not birthing Christians. That means we're not soul winners at all. So if we ought to have a constant flow of new baby Christians, people that are going to be immature, people that are going to do weird things at weird times, but we must help them, we must love them and bring them along. All of us at some point were that. We're an immature baby Christian. If they'll, if they'll do a few things, they'll, they'll learn to go beyond just being a simple follower. The emotion is good. By the way, you should never stop at any stage. You should never stop being a follower of Jesus Christ. And at no stage should you ever stop loving the Lord with all your heart and being excited about your salvation. You never should grow out of that. But sometimes there's people that they love, they know they're saved. God's fixed this situation. God's healed them of that problem. God's given them victory over that issue. And that's as far as they've gotten. Well, good, I'm glad they're starting there. But if they'll do, a few, if they'll do five simple things, they will grow. And you already probably know what they are. Number one, if they'll study their Bible, they'll grow. You cannot grow without studying your Bible. We talked about that last week. There's a second thing, they need to pray. Read your Bible, pray. There's a third one, faithfully attend church. You cannot grow as a Christian unless you faithfully attend church. You just can't do it. You're disobedient and your growth is stunted. And you'll miss out on what God wants to teach you. Because believe it or not, there's other people that can tell you something that you've not yet learned. There's a fourth thing, you've got to give faithfully. That's, that's money and of yourself. People don't like that. People don't, that don't like that being talked about, but it's biblical. You've got to have a giving heart. You've got to faithfully give, tithe, give missions, things like that. There's a fifth thing, you've got to witness. It's amazing how witnessing will help you grow. Start sharing your faith. You'll get a greater burden for the lost. 
You'll start to learn what you don't know when they start asking you questions. And every one, every one of our failures as a Christian can be traced back to one of those five things. Every one of them. But we should all be followers. So those people we need to reach, we win them to, we win them to Christ, we reach them, and they become a follower. And then what's the third one? Search for the W. What's the next one? Workers. 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 Verse number one. And the twelve were with him. The twelve. These were with him as followers before, before as the gospel, when the gospel record started. At least several of them weren't saved yet. So they were people to be reached. Andrew reached his own brother, Peter. But these twelve were almost always present. They were almost always faithful. Were they perfect? No, but they're always there, always involved, always helping. But God took these workers and did something with them. Let's see them work. Let's look at the, go to the next chapter in Luke 9, verse 1. Then He called His twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. These twelve, who were just recently people that needed to be reached and in some ways, we're just followers. They've now been given a command to be soul winners. These fishermen and tax collectors and other things, they're now soul winners, they're now preachers, and God's power is on them. Not long ago, they were just being reached, and now they're workers. Again, the primary work for any Christian is to win souls. Let's look at another passage, a few verses down, we'll find something else they do. In Luke 9, verse 16. Then he took the five loaves and the two fishes and, looked, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and break and gave to his disciples to set before the multitude. At no stage did they outgrow being servants. Here, what are they doing now? The spiritual work of handing out lunch. They're workers. They got involved in the miraculous work of God by serving. But you know what? It didn't end there. Go to Luke 10. So the next chapter, Luke 10 verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two and two before His face into every city and place whither He Himself would come. Who are these seventy or the additional fifty-eight? Yes, fifty-eight. Who are the additional fifty-eight or additional seventy, whatever it be? I don't know. But they were probably just now followers. We shouldn't stay where we are. We need, to be, we need to love the Lord. We need to be followers. But these followers became workers. They got more involved. God gave them greater responsibility as they learned and grew. But the workers will always come from the followers. And the workers, many of them will often turn into leaders. Luke 8, verse 1. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the twelve were with him. The him is Jesus, the leader. Jesus is obviously the leader here. He's the Lord, he's the master, and he's the shepherd. He's the one that leads the workers. He's the one that here, he, the one that makes the final decision. He's the one that encourages and makes the work go forward. It says several things about this leader, Jesus, that we can make application with. He says he went through every city and village. A leader, a spiritual leader is interested in others. What was he doing? Preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. He was proclaiming the truth to others and he was living it out. He was not only preaching, but he was showing. There's a difference between just preaching and preaching and showing. People need to see it. People need to see the Bible lived out. It says in the 12 were with him. He was helping others become leaders. Before you get, I know when you get to the end of the gospel records, we find Peter and we find the other disciples running away scared, their tails between their legs. Let's go to Acts 1. And we're almost done. Acts 1, verse 15. Acts 1, 15. <clears throat> 
says, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of the names together, about 120 men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. There's something very practical that happened in that verse. Who's the new leader of the church? I don't necessarily know all the ins and outs of it, but it sure looks like Peter. Peter was someone that needed to be reached by his brother Andrew. Then Peter became a follower. Then Peter became a worker. And now Peter's the leader. In Acts 2, verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Some of the workers became leaders, and leaders developed leaders. I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, but folks, there's people that always need to be reached. And I don't know what you are necessarily. And again, you, whatever you are, whatever God wants you to be, let's grow, let's mature, and maybe God wants you to take the next step forward. The followers, they did some stuff. But I think there's a difference, and it's not just because there are women. It says many others. There's probably men there too. But there was a difference, I think, practically between the many others and the 12 apostles there. I think we understand that. No importance, difference. No difference in importance. But they took some other steps that other people weren't willing to take. Do you want God to use you? Do you want to be a builder? Grow. Do you want God's work to be done? Let's reach people so they'll grow. Because the work that has to be done, but we need to reach more people. For the world to be evangelized, we need to win souls. I'm going to finish with this. Jessica knows I'm stealing this too. But I'm going to show you how evangelism happens. Some of you have seen this before. I may have done this before. I'm going to, we're going to, every time someone is reached, it's going to be an illustration of one year. So within one year's time, I'm going to win my son Cooper to Jesus. Cooper, come here. He likes getting embarrassed. Come here quick. So within one year's time, I reached him. So what, what's my job now? To reach other people and to disciple him. But if he gets properly discipled, what will he do? He'll reach people. Go reach people. Go get someone and bring them here. And I'll grab Ken. Quickly. Quickly. There were, how many started? Me. One. Within a year's time, there's, within one year, there's them. Then the next year, there's four. So that's, I guess, two years, maybe three. We'll say two. Doesn't matter. Let's go reach somebody. Years. Three years. Jessica, the boss says three years. All right, Ken, go reach somebody. Jessica, you're mine. Go reach somebody. Go reach somebody. Quickly, quickly, quickly. The longer you take, the longer this message goes. She's mine. Four years. There, were, there was one, and now there's eight. Four years. Go reach somebody. I get Annie. Uh, Ellie, sorry. <laughs> I'm a bad parent. There's five years. If someone doesn't want to get up, go to somebody else. <laughs> Everyone likes being embarrassed and on TV. Five years. It's amazing how quick something can happen. Go reach somebody. Jose, you're mine. Jessica's my counter. She's six years. Go reach somebody. Okay, go stand by your reached. You're mine. So that's, this is winning one soul to Jesus a year. We're about to run out of people. Has everyone reached somebody? Go get somebody. Quickly. Brother Andy, you belong to her. Brother Andy just got reached. All right. Andy what year are we on? Six? Okay. We'll just call it right here. If there were, there's more of us than there are of you, that can probably preach. There's more of us than there are of you. It's amazing what happens in seven years to, the, to our church size if everyone just wins one soul. And a disciple them enough just to get one more person in church. If everyone got one person 
time to build. It don't take long to reach people, does it? And we ought to probably do better than just one a year, but let's just do one a year. Every person, a worker, a builder, just reaching one soul. Y'all can all find your seat. <clears throat> you get the point? <laughs> Yes, exponential growth. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> yeah. Jessica, uh, Jessica reminded me. Someone did that before, and they did the math. If that went on one a year for 33 years, the entire world would be reached with the gospel. Math is pretty cool. Hopefully she's right. Pretty close. One generation, if we just reach people and make that person, I reach them with God's help. I'm going to teach them a little bit. I'm going to love them. I'm going to invest them. I'm going to help them grow and teach them to win people to Jesus. And by the way, that is what we just did, as simple as an illustration as that is, that is what Jesus fully expects us to do. So are you growing and who are you reaching? If we're going to build labors for Christ, we must grow and we must reach people.